All right, there we go. Steve Meller, welcome to the podcast, mate. How are you doing? I'm great, Brett. Good to be seeing you. Good to be uh, catching up here. It's been a while. So It has been a while, mate. Last time uh, we kind of fully checked in, you were, you were in swimming coaching. Yeah. Now you're in the world of performance coaching, which is um, obviously similar um but but different at the same time you're out on your own you're doing your own thing you're writing books you're uh you're really advancing here mate i love it i love to, i love to see people step out and do do new things man yeah that's a that's a good way of putting it stepping out um you know betting on myself is kind of how i've been telling people for some time now what is it what does it look like to bet on yourself uh what is that moment of truth if you will where you say okay I know what I want to do. I know what the process looks like. When am I ready to truly commit to it? And before you know it, um, you, you're doing it. And then you just have to continue to check in and say, How, how's it going? How am I doing? And fortunately enough, I have enough clients already and enough businesses that I'm working with that I'm getting some good, strong, consistent, positive feedback. So, uh, so yeah, so far, no complaints. Awesome, man. I love it. I was actually just having this conversation yesterday with – one of the best coaches in the world uh, that I that I think I'm not going to drop his name right now because we're, it was a, definitely a private conversation, but it was the same type of thing. You know, he's at a crossroads where he's like, "Brett, I've done everything there is to do, and, and swimming is you know my passion, but like, what else is there?" He's like, "It's comfortable for me. I feel comfortable. Like I'm getting offers from all these top federations and and teams around the world." But that's the easy option, isn't it? Isn't it incredible when you get to that level, and then that still can become the easy option? And he's looking at stepping out and doing something different too, you know. And so I relate to that right now, just because of the the, the business owners that I'm working with. Um, so many of them, they come to me and they just say, like, these options that I have in front of me now, I don't feel necessarily challenged by them, mm -hmm. and I've I've climbed many a mountain. Uh, and I've had many a success and I've so many plaudits along the way. And here I am in some cases, 20, 25 years into business ownership, wondering what else is there? And mm. I actually really enjoy meeting them in that space because that's when I get to really work on what I'm most passionate about, which is that of just what is their best self? What is their optimal self? How can they keep finding and discovering things out about themselves that they hadn't necessarily considered because they've been so ingrained in that process of building what it is they've built and having the career that they've had and especially in the sport of swimming you know investing so much in athletes investing so much in so many processes so many seasons after seasons after seasons you get to a point where you blink and 20 years has gone by mm. and, and you're just like well hell like <laughs> now what and, and and again you've got all these opportunities all these offers but you in so many ways feel as though you've been there and done it so many times that the challenge or the appeal, let's say, doesn't quite seem as as good as it once was. Yeah, it's 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 super interesting. And look, I I got there myself. I think uh, I've I've talked about that many times on my podcast in terms of what I was doing. A lot of people said to me, you know, you're you're in a top five program in the world in terms of head coaching at at Auburn, and I'd been there ten years doing that, and it got to me where you know, I was waking up and I wasn't jumping out of bed. You know, it wasn't like, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. And while, while you get to a point where other people are envious of where you are and maybe even jealousy and, and, and some of those negative connotations, but probably a lot of supporters as well. You don't, you don't recognize the supporters until you're out of it, but um, you know, you get to a point where you just certainly feel flat and um, <clears throat> you know, you need something else. And that's where I was. And I, I started my podcast you have gone on to start a, a podcast which is very successful as well, the the Career Competitor Podcast. That's the one, right? That's right. And, and what's funny, man, is I actually I actually started it like four and a half years ago. Um, I was doing it while I was swim coaching, and and mm. so for me, it, it's almost the beginning of. It, it was really where I began to realize that there was maybe a little bit more outside of the mm. world of swimming that I'd never necessarily entertained or or been willing to even look at. Um, a, a big part of big part of doing it actually was to encourage athletes to to do the same to not get so caught up in the sort of nine to five mindset of swim 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 school mm. school school and and just have no life outside of that so i kind of just sort of said well if, if i'm going to encourage that what better way to do that than just showing that it can be done mm. as a coach that i would argue has probably more stuff <laughs> to be responsible for 
um, than just their own swimming career, you know? So for me, that was kind of the beginning of that process for me. And I would never have assumed it would have led to me starting my own business called career competitor, but, um, that's what life can do sometimes. Right. Yep. And then here we are now you've, you've written a book, which is about to come out, which is super exciting. I, I've had similar thoughts, I guess, but I can't write, so I don't feel real comfortable there, but, um, <laughs> certainly not enough to put a book together that someone would read and so you've you've seemed to have done that so congrats on that uh Thanks. big big effort what what's the what's the you know the the process from going like you know i want to write a book and then actually having a book written um having a good idea to begin with and, okay. and you know for me i was very fortunate that life handed me just an awesome story in that of my work with with brooks curry at lsu and, you know, for, for me, that story on its own could probably be a book by itself, a kid that was completely unrecruited. And when I say unrecruited, I mean unrecruited. But, you know, mm -hmm. no one, no one even looked his way. No one had conversations with him. And he and I has had some sort of a connection early on in that process. Um, and fast forward two and a half years from when he sort of got to LSU or when we, you know, started recruiting him and he got to LSU and, He's making the, the 2020 games in the summer of 2021. Um, you know, the book's called Shock the World, A Competitor's Guide to Realizing Your Potential. And in so many ways, that's that's what Brooks's story was, was a, a kid with a ton of potential that needed a path and needed the, the you know, the right environment to bring that potential to light. Uh, so the book outlines, it touches on his story in places. The, the introduction to the book is actually all about the uh, the moment that he made the games um, and between Brooks and I we actually had this sort of two year mantra if you will of shock the world when he first sat down and told me he wanted to make the games um, you know we had that back and forth on a week to week basis where we just look at him in the face after he'd done something good and be like hey shock the world's looking good and a couple of weeks would go by and he'd look at me and coach feeling good shock the world and it was just always this sort of acknowledgement of hey we're, we're trying to do something special um but the book also entails a ton of stories from my podcast a ton of life stories as well um but yeah it's cool it's there's not many books out there right with the genesis of a swimming story and, and mm, so for me that's yeah. that's what i'm really excited about for people to read well listen that's why that's why i love my podcast uh myself because i get to tell swimming stories you know people always say to me brett like why don't you branch out? Why don't you do other things? And I, and I have, I've dabbled in it. I like it, but look, there's not enough people telling swimming stories. Well, it's a fantastic sport. And there are people that are putting in, you know, grinding work for years and years and years. And they, they, they all have their own story. You as a coach, us as a swimmers, you know, so it's like these stories are incredible. And, and look, we get every single day, we get stories of how great, you know, American football players are, how great basketball players are, how great baseball players are. It's like, okay, we get it, right? Like every day it's in our face, but these swimmers aren't getting the love and the respect and the coaches that they deserve either. So I like telling swimming stories. So I'm glad you've written a book on a swimming story like Brooks Curry. What an incredible story that is. I, I don't even, I haven't even read the pages of it yet, but I, I've, from an outside looking in, I'm like, I want to know more, you know, like this, yeah. this is an incredible story. You talk about potential, right? Like, how do you how do you judge potential um, in terms of taking a guy who wasn't recruited to then getting him to be ultimately an Olympic gold medalist, right? Yeah, so, right. how do you judge this potential? For me, potential doesn't it doesn't really mean anything unless there's a, a true desire to realize it at the core of it. You know, I think coming through sport in the UK, I, I mean, I played every sport under the sun and, you know, I, I play football, Americans call soccer, um, growing up and, you know, you could see a kid with a ball at his feet and you just knew he just screamed potential, mm. but that didn't necessarily mean that he wanted to go on and be a professional football player. You know, at some point he'd have to make that decision and someone around him and people around him would have to give him the support system required to realize that potential. And I saw so many people like that growing up who, you could see the potential, but you always got this feeling like that. They didn't. They don't necessarily want it badly enough to make the commitment required to realize it. And to use the example of Brooks, Brooks, I don't think. Firstly, he didn't know how how great his potential was. I think there was guys at Dynamo that certainly did. Uh, you know, Ian Murray 
very much was aware of that from the very beginning. Um, but the perfect example with him is that I could see his potential as a swimmer, but it, it just didn't mean anything if he couldn't convince me that he wanted to realize it. And, and I think that's a big part of the process that, you know, we've both been around swimming for so long and you, you watch someone swim through a pool and you go, my goodness, look at that potential. It just, just get them in the right environment. And that that's going to be someone that just does something incredible. Mm. But that environment, that environment is a huge, huge part of it. So identifying potential is one thing, but if you can't get that potential in the right environment, it doesn't really mean anything. You know, it, it has to be in an environment where it can truly grow the way it organically needs to grow. And I, I will say that about, about Brooks's story is that people see the product that he is today. And it's like, oh, he, you know, he could have been successful anywhere. And I'm like, well, I push back against that because for, for me, it, it disrespects the environment that we created mm -hmm. for him. Um, but secondly, he's a specific individual and that specific individual with that potential needs a specific environment for it to blossom. Mm -hmm. and, right. and, and so, so yeah, so that's, the, you know, for me is, I know your, your question was more about like, how do you recognize the potential? But for me, it's always saying, okay, uh, you know, you and I have both seen so much potential over the years what does the specific nature of the environment that potential is allowed to be in to actually be realized? Yeah, it's interesting, right? Like an environment is key and, and people come from all sorts of different environments, right? I guess that's why they get to go on these recruiting trips to kind of select the type of environment that they want to be part of ultimately. Mm -hmm. um, so how did you and, and the team at LSU at that point in time, decide what type of environment you were going to be how do you, how do you create the environment that you want it, it starts with personal connection uh, for, for me it's so funny here we are talking about storytelling um i got athletes over the years that will tell you like oh you know it's story time with steve <laughs> it's story time <laughs> with steve and, and I, i've always been a storyteller it's why i had the podcast it's why i've written a book um and it's, it's very much a one of the um you know labels of me as a coach is a, a guy that likes to tell stories uh, so for, for me, that one-on-one -on -one element of, of the environment that I specifically created with those that I was able to, uh, to coach, um, it, it all came about down to like, what, when do you have five minutes? If you have five minutes, let's sit down and let's talk. Um, mm. let's, let's continue to build that connection. Um, you know, for me, you can have the greatest plan in place from a physiological standpoint, but at some point you have to recognize that extra sort of 5% of potential is only going to be touched if you're willing to take the time to build the relationship as well. And, and right. so for me, that, that I've always been that coach and the work that I do today, it allows for less distraction in order to build that relationship when I'm just going into a business owner's office and sitting down with them and just talking face to face. Um, but in the world of swimming, I think a lot of the time coaches can be guilty of saying, I don't have time for that. I don't have time to sit down and just sort of talk to you for five minutes and talk to you for five minutes, et cetera. But I think we do. I think we do. And I think that was the culture that I used to always emphasize within my work is, okay, what does that, what does that sacrifice look like to say, I have five minutes for you today. I have five minutes to learn about what it is you're going, what's going on with you today. And it allows me to coach you better too, because now I, I know you on a more personal level, so I can tell when something's off. You know, I can tell when something's off. I can tell when something you brought something into the pool from your day that for whatever reason you did not leave at the door and, mm. and and we need to sit down and have a little conversation about that and because you know them well enough you know that conversation can be a lot quicker a lot more effective um because you've already made that effort to create that personal uh relationship and so for me i'm i'm, I'm super proud of that with the work that i always did with lsu because here i am a year out of swimming now and still have tens and tens of, of athletes from the past every week or two coming to me for a, a perspective or a piece of advice yeah. or whatever it is. Um, and uh, yeah, man, I mean, that was a big part of how I coach for sure. So definitely relationship building is a huge part of culture development then for you, right? And, and, and building those relationships. So is that, is that what you do? Is that transferable? Like, do you go into a business now and, and when you're talking to executives, do you talk to them about this relationship building as well? I do. And it starts with the relationship that I have with them. And, and the beauty of that is I, I then get to use that 
is an example of how they can start to hold themselves to higher standards of how they go and create relationships with those that they oversee. Mm. And, and that was a big part going back to the culture question. It's all well and good if coach is making the effort to connect with athletes, but if, if, if that's not leading to the athletes then connecting with one another, then there's something missing in that process. Uh, that's where the culture truly starts to build, right? When the athletes start to connect and prioritize one another too. And so for me, that it, it's so it, it's it's never stopped surprising me in terms of just how many things are similar within the corporate America space as you see in the highest level of sport. And I'm fortunate that I, a lot of my clients already have some sort of a sports background, so we can kind of speak in that type of space. Um, and, and, and there's a lot more in common uh, with the conversation and the topics that we go through. But with that being said, that ability to sit down and coach someone in that space, and so much of coaching in the corporate space is about getting them to see a, a weakness of theirs themselves as opposed to sort of just throwing it at them and just saying, hey, improve at this, hey, work on this. Mm. You're trying to kind of get them to that place on their, on their own. And through that relationship, through that communication style, in a way, you're also teaching them how they can do the very same with those that they oversee. And, and mm. so for me, I think it's powerful. And um, But like I said, if, if, if you're in that type of relationship and it's just a one-to-one -one and there's no residual effect from that relationship across other people, in many ways, there's still work to do because I think that's the, the beauty of it is if it's done right, the, put, the people that are in that conversation, they can then go away and use that very same approach and continue to build more relationships and stronger cultures etc from from that moment from that moment on right i guess i guess what i'm taking away there is like you can have all the intention in the world to create that relationship but the person on on the receiving end has to be willing to receive and accept and then develop that as well so there has to be this this connection of like look i'm going to meet you here you got to meet me there and then together we can do incredible things and i guess that's ultimately what brooks decided with you and and the things that you're instilling in him we individualize training in the pool so why not individualize your nutrition erica barney of barney wellness building will help you and your swimmers get exactly what each athlete needs through genetic testing and personalized nutrition plans so stop guessing what you should and shouldn't be putting into your body Athletes within a few weeks have noticed they're recovering faster because they're fueling their body with what they need and staying away from what their body hates. Erica understands swimming. She gets it. She's worked with over 20 Olympians, including the fastest man in the world, Caleb Dressel. Group discounts are available. So go to Biney Wellness Building and get in touch with Erica today. That's Biney, B-E-I-N-E, wellnessbuilding.net. Swim Angelfish. Swim Angelfish is an online certification program that strengthens your teaching curriculum to serve swimmers of all abilities. Swim Angelfish will prepare you and your instructors with the skills to teach swimmers with autism, physical disabilities, anxiety, sensory and motor conditions, and more. Learn to teach skills faster and with more comfort with Swim Angelfish. Apply for an only alpha pool product scholarship and receive up to 50% off your certification. Go to swimangelfish.com today to apply. What are some of the other big takeaways that we can, you know, really dive into here in the, in the book, shock the world, you know, some of those things that we can take away from Brooks, those learnings that, you know, other people could apply. Yeah. The, the, the book was uh, purposely written in, in three phases. Um, so there's, there's 10 chapters total. And then in, in blocks of threes, and I think as I'm talking here, I'm hearing this sort of swim coach come through, you start thinking mm. about seasons and micro cycles, mm. macro cycles and all that kind of thing. But, you know, there's a lot of that in the book, but there's, there's three chapters that are very much phase one and then another three that are phase two and another three that are phase three. And the reason I wrote it that way is because similar to the story of Brooks, there was a foundational element when it came to his identity, his mindset, and his approach mm -hmm. that needed to be built in order we before we start thinking about how can we work on your habits, how can we work on your execution, all these sort of things. There's no point getting to that more sort of end product until you've worked on that foundational element. And that's what the first phase of the book is, how you can shock your identity, shock your mindset, and shock your approach. And by doing so, set yourself up for those next two phases where you can then really start to get a little bit more specific with details and, and habits, like I said, and then the way in which we execute. 
Um, because for me, I think when you, I want to continue to use Brooks as an example, like when a talent like that comes in, a coach looks at that and says, okay, wow, let's get to work. Let's get to work. Let's start, let's start maximizing that potential from day one. Let's start mm -hmm. working hard. Let's start doing this, start doing this, teach him this, teach him this. And it's like, well, what happens if that work that you're doing doesn't stick right away? You, you're right back to where you were at the beginning. So why not create that foundation, like I said, of, of building the person, building the mindset that's required to become an Olympian, and then start to talk about what does that day-to-day -day approach look like to actually showing up to this pool and carrying yourself as a potential Olympic gold medalist? Because you don't do that just by working hard. It's, it's an entire approach it's an entire shift of mindset and that doesn't happen overnight that's an ongoing process and that again like i said is is the beauty of the book is that that first phase if you read those three chapters and you do the little worksheets that i put in the book too and you really start to get to know yourself better sometimes you start to recognize i'm actually more capable and i'm actually more hungry to achieve even greater things than i even addressed because i hadn't mm. even thought enough about who it is I am, what it is I want to accomplish. You've just been focused on, hey, what's the person next to you is doing? And you haven't really spent time and focused on you in terms of how you can best bring yourself along. And so a lot of that work that I did with Brooks on the, on the front end, his first six months at LSU, was the human being. It, it wasn't the summer, it was the human being. And, and, and again, that was an approach I took with all my athletes. It just so happened that Brooks was the first one that went and got himself an Olympic gold medal. Wow. Yeah, so, so much to take away there. And, and I'm having flashbacks of, you know, certain people that, that come through my program too. And um, sure. I've kind of connected with uh, an idea or a thought or a, a philosophy that they really latch onto and then seem to have kind of kicked on and had success with that as well. In terms of um, this style, right, and, and Brooks connecting with it, are there times where you have to step out of that and – uh, change the philosophy for anybody at all like may maybe they're not connecting with that approach but they, they may connect with you know there are some people that like to be told what to do and be you know i wouldn't say um necessarily no one likes to be yelled at but there are certainly people that like to be told just point blank you got to get this done right and so yeah. are there times where you do step out of that philosophy a little bit yeah it's the and this is where I start to think more about the work I do today with, with business owners is this notion of like, when, when you start the relationship, what, what part of their process are you arriving in? You know, it's like, so if I'm working with a guy that's been running a business for 25, 30 years, that's not the time for us to start figuring out his identity. And, you know, like that, <laughs> that, 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 that's a, that, that ships sailed a long time ago right, guy in his fifties, right. sixties and all that kind of thing. Yeah. So then you start to say, okay, well, what does work for you or what hasn't worked for you and let's sort of let's start there in that process mm. you know so the average swimmer when they arrive uh, in college probably been swimming for 10 years year round at least for maybe seven or eight so they've already got a lot of habits they've already got a lot of ways right. in which they approach what it is they do mm. so more often than not getting to know them is is obviously important but at the same time, you can actually move a little bit further along in the process if that if, if they are arriving with a much greater toolbox, if you will, of, of, mm. of habits and details and, and, and the standard that they, they're at. Um, you can start to maybe focus on details a little bit earlier. You can maybe mm. focus on how what it means to execute in different ways a little bit earlier. Um, right. And again, the example with Brooks is like the, the kid wasn't even swimming year round until he was 16. You know, so it's just like <laughs> when you're working with that, type of raw you know mm. blank slate if you will right. you'd be crazy not to just sort of stop and say hey let's let's look at the blank slate and start there but again like i said over the years sometimes you'd have internationals coming from the uk and and wherever else around europe and they've been in junior teams for four five six years mm -hmm. so they've already got an idea of what does it mean to be professional what does it mean to show up correctly and all that kind of thing so you're further along in that process and to your point brett Maybe they are someone that's just like, coach, tell me what to do. And, and it's like, okay, that sounds good. If that's, if that's what the relationship needs to be to get yeah. the best out of you, right. then that's what it needs to be. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. How does, uh, how does Brooks feel about a book being ultimately yeah. kind of focused on him? Do you feel good about that? He does. I mean, he actually, there's a little bit about him in the book in the sense of uh, he, 
when I was done with about 95% of it, uh, I sat down with him and uh, we kind of relived it. We, re we mm. relived that sort of two and a half year process. And he reminded me of a few things, which is really cool. Um, you know, and uh, there's a, in the, the, the 10th chapter of the book, there's two pages in, in Brooks's woods. Um, so, so Brooks's mm. voice is in the book and he talks a little bit about that moment when we first met and, and discussed this notion of him making a games um, and the way in which he had to slowly evolve and adapt to, you know, the expectations that come with that. Um, so I think he's excited about it. And again, it's, it's not like there's any wow factor or revealing information. It's, it, it's all about the stuff that, um, is, is, is important for people to know in terms of just like, Hey, this is how you go from someone who is keen to do something that will truly shock the world to bring in it to light. And, and there's no, like I said, there's there's nothing that's going to make him uncomfortable or anything like that within the book. It's it's all just the uh, the great, positive, exciting content that uh, you know his story was all about. You know. Yeah, that's it's interesting. As you as you're talking there, I'm I'm flashing back to my podcast with Caesar. You know, we we finally sat down after about a, a ten year kind of gap in, in our lives to kind of re rehash a lot of that. And it's interesting that you know you have your perspective as as a coach, and you think that this is the way it went. And then you get to hear them, you know, give their opinion. It's like, oh, okay, you had a different perspective on that. All right, I, yeah. did, I didn't see it that way, but right. um, that's cool to to be able to do that with an athlete. Very special, and so, certainly something that's going to um, last forever. Now, you know, it's 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 on print. It's it's on paper. People can pick it up and read it. Now, in terms of the book itself, when's it coming out? Where can people find it? Uh, you know, do you know how much it's going to cost or anything like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's going to be out out um around mid-october i think october 15th is is what i'm doing I've, I've i've set up a platform where you can actually pre-order it and uh what's cool about that is i can kind of send you some personal stuff um in mm -hmm. addition to the book as well sign sign the book and uh maybe put in a note or two just about whoever it is that's buying the book and um you know ways that they can really use the book to the best of their ability um so you can actually go to my website uh, careercompetitor.com mm -hmm. and it's just forward slash shock the world and uh it's it's right there on the website if you just go to careercompetitor.com anyway on the home page you can just click it and go ahead and order it and one thing i i tell everybody as well is that um you know it, it works from a coaching side of things too if you if you read if you read the book from the perspective of how can i use this book to influence others the beauty of that is that you can kind of start to think about how you can help others shock the world as opposed to strictly making it about the person that's reading it. Uh, there's, there's that ability to sort of apply it elsewhere. Um, so mm. I'm excited about maybe, you know, coaches and swimmers being able to see this and say, okay, I can see it from the swimmers perspective, but I can also see it from those leading the swimmers perspective uh, as well. And uh, any, any teams and coaches that are like, Hey, let's do a, a 20, like, let's get 20 30 books and do a whole thing with steve you know I'm, I'm obviously here for that and people can reach out to direct uh reach out to me directly for that top, type of opportunity cool that's awesome i love it we'll have all this stuff we'll put it all in the in the show notes as well so people can click on this stuff and get to you as well hmm. um that's awesome T tell me uh, again uh, about some more of these transferable skills you know you talk about building relationships as as an important skill right that anybody can utilize what are some of the other transferable skills that, you know, in day-to-day -day processes that successful people use and will certainly need to be, to continue to be successful? Yeah, the, it's right there in my business name, competitor. Um, right. You know, for me, it, it's a funny word. And, and when I first, um, when I first came up with the name of my podcast four and a half years ago, I was very deliberate about using the word competitor because it's, it is a word that can make some people uncomfortable, um, especially people that are more introverted. They're like, I'm not, you know, I'm not a competitive person. It's like, well, my belief is that we all are competitive in, in our own way. And, and, and it comes to light in, in different ways. And um, the, the one, the beauty of the, the podcast I've been running now is that over time, successful people would come on and talk about how they themselves were their greatest competitor. And uh, what I've started to tailor now in the work that I do is the type of competitor that you are. And it's really important because when you can actually establish that, you can really start to use it to your advantage. Because if you try to dismiss the fact that you're competitive, you're actually limiting, in my opinion, your ability to optimize your talent, your potential, however you want to put it. So if you can start to say, okay, one, I am competitive, but two, 
how do I identify the way in which my competitive instinct, my competitive fire really comes to light? Because I think there's an, there's an opportunity for everyone to be that little bit more competitive, that little bit more ambitious, just by knowing that information about themselves. Mm. And, um, you know, a great example of this is I work with a couple of business owners that are a one person shop, you know, and, and, and so with that being said, it's, like, it's not like they're competing with anybody within their office. And they are competing with people in their industry, but it's, it's not as though they're competing with them in a way where they can see one another. So what does that look like in terms of you going about your day in a way where you can be attentive to the fact that you are in a competitive industry, but you don't see the competition around you. You don't feel the competition around mm. you every single day. When we start talking about what does it mean to be accountable? What does it mean to have responsibilities? What does it mean to manage your time and your energy to the best of your ability? Because all of those things, in my opinion, Brent, they sum up a competitive individual. If you want to, if you want to be competitive, you need to have control over those types of things. Right. Um, and, and, and when you get to the top of the sport of swimming, so so often you're training in an environment where you aren't being challenged by the person next to you. So mm. what does that mean to be competitive against the stopwatch, against the coach on the side? You know, any information that you can get a hold of outside of the four walls of the facility that you train in. Um, because I think that can sometimes be a hindrance at the very, very, very top of the sport is if you are in this private remote environment as a competitor and then you're thrown into competition, how ready and prepared are you for those moments to truly be challenged when you're not necessarily used to embracing that on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, well said, mate. I like that. I like that a lot. Lot to lot to take away there for people. Um, I was I was listening intently because I'm in the tech world now. You know, I'm right. I work for a company called Any Question, and uh, the tech space is completely new to me, man. But uh, and sometimes I wake up, and I'm like, where's my competitors? Who are they? And and they're they're kind of invisible. I mean, they're out there, and there's some there's some cutthroats out there in the tech world for sure. Right. But uh, they're not in your face. You don't see them. They don't they don't wake up next to you every day and so everything that you said right there is certainly um, something that I've had to kind of uh, identify with just recently of like, okay, how can I be, who am I and how can I be competitive within right. myself, right? right? And so these daily processes of saying, well, these are my standards. These are the things that I want to accomplish each day. And when I hit these goals at this level, I know that nobody can compete with me because I'm doing it beyond, right? Right. Right. Or if they can compete, that's at the really high level. Like you got to be, you got to bring your A game today and what you're doing to be able to hang with what I'm doing in in, in my daily processes. And look, I live in I live in Delaware, man. Like I'm, if I walk out this front door here or that back door, I'm surrounded by basically farmland, right? <laughs> and so every day I wake up, and even in the podcast situation, um, you know what it's like booking guests and right. doing these sorts of things is like it can be. Um, very solitary and invisible yep. at times and, and right. you just you got to get the work done ultimately that's what it comes down to in in anything that you want to be successful at you got to get the work done and yep. um, that that comes from an inner desire to want to be great at whatever you do so yeah yeah and, and something I like to use um, it, it was one of these it's been the beauty of starting a business in the last year is that I've started to give terms to things that I was already doing as a swim coach. And, but you know, when you're trying to brand yourself to an, uh, a potential client, you got to be, you know, you, you, you've got to fall into that marketing space, come up with snappy terms and things like yeah. that. And, and for me, um, there's this thing that I call the minimum standard now and people hear a term like that and they go, oh, it's like, you mean like the bare minimum? I'm like, no, I mean, what is your minimum standard? What is the standard that you have to hold yourself accountable to each and every day to ensure that you are being the most competitive version of yourself that you are moving the needle in your career in your business whatever shape or form of your life we're talking about if you have a high minimum standard if you have a minimum standard that out does all your competitors and it's kind of that same sort of mindset of how good are you on your bad day mm. that same sort of mindset if you can take a minimum standard and make it so high Mm -hmm. you know that at your worst you're always going to be better than say 80 85 percent of the people at what you do then you know you're setting yourself up for great things yeah 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 it's interesting I, I can connect with with that for sure and then then on on the grander scale you know i would have swimmers come to me at the end of the year and as as the head coach would say hey coach can i get a an increase in scholarship and and i'd say okay sure let's talk about it and, and i want you to present your case and they said well 
I qualified for NCAA, so I, I deserve a, uh, an increase in scholarship. I, I always say, like, that's, that was the minimum standard. Like, we, that was the expectation of, like, coming in here. You were, you were going to qualify for NCAAs. That wasn't, like, if you do or I hope you do or when you do. It was, like, that was going to happen. Now, the, the standard beyond that is now we're, you know, we're in, in the B final, the A final. We're on the podium. We're, we're winning races. Like, these are the standards that go a little bit beyond the minimum. So mm. I would always laugh when people would say that. Well, no, absolutely. And, and it, goes, it goes back to what we were talking about before with culture too. Like, when, when enough people, uh, when enough individuals raise their minimum standard, then slowly the culture starts right. to raise its minimum standard. Exactly. And, and that, yeah. that's the... And again, I've been working with a couple of businesses just long enough now to see the beginnings of that. And that's what's exciting about the work that I do now is that yep. you work with enough individuals for long enough and you keep slowly working those minimum standards higher and higher. Suddenly you walk into their office space one day and you're like, huh, something's, something's shifted. Something's happening here. Yep. And that's, that's yep. exciting. Well, listen, man, I'm, I'm happy for you. I love that you've stepped out of swimming for your own comfort zone. Uh, but for swimming's sake, I love that you've stepped back in and given us this resource now of this book that we can really dive into and keep and learn from for, for many years to come. So I appreciate that. Um, keep doing those little things, man. Swimming needs you for sure. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, keep keep uh, working that other angle. But, but dip your toe back into swimming because we can't lose people like you. You're too good, man. All right? Oh, well, I, that's some kind words, man. I appreciate it. And I'll, I'll be sure to, to keep dipping those toes in from time to time. Yeah, man. All right, Steve. Thanks a lot, mate. We'll talk Cheers. to you soon. Yep. Cheers. See ya. Destro Swim Towers. Gain strength in the water with a tower of power. Save $150 per double swim tower by using code BRETT, B-R-E-T-T, -T, at checkout. DestroMachines.com. Vasa has been the go-to training tool outside of the pool for over 30 years. Vasa's products are ideal for developing power and proper technique in your swimmer's catch. Add a few Vasa trainers to your pool deck and it's like adding an extra lane to your swimming pool. Go to vasatrainer.com, use code BREAD at checkout and get 10% off anything from Vasa.